Good to see you again. How are things going? It's so far so good. Great. School started. Oh, yeah. Which yeah. Isn't so great. <laughs> well, but it happens to all of us. Yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> all right. Hi, Russell Dr. Halls. It's a pleasure to meet you. Nice My name is Chin Chin. Okay. Right. Um, and oh, and this has a. Yeah, she's a, one of my friends as an Nano Explorer also. So. Oh, okay. Great. Very good. Yeah, well, we'll <laughs> talk about that offline. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> We're good to go. Um, hi, my name is Tess Michaels, and I'm a nano explorer here at UTD. And this is my friend Chin Chin Yang, and she's also a nano explorer here at UTD. And of course, this is Dr. Hulse, who's a Nobel laureate for, for the 1993 prize in physics for the binary pulsar, which is about a twin star system um, that it allows you to work in a natural setting in a laboratory, and it kind of proves some of Einstein's theories. And obviously, it was a very successful project for his accomplishment of winning the Nobel Prize. So, yes. This is my graduate work, actually. I oh, really? That, yes. Oh. So, that's so something to look forward to for graduate school. Can you tell us about how you like came up? What was your inspiration, your motivation for your project? Well, the actually, the interesting thing about the binary pulsar discovery is that it's really a classic case of scientific serendipity, because that's not what we were looking for. Uh, Pulsars, which are these rotating neutron stars that generate regularly pulsed radio radiation, have been discovered about 10 years earlier by Jocelyn Bell and Tony Ewish. And uh, Jocelyn Bell was a graduate student at the time, too. So pulsars have a certain, certain theme here of uh, uh, grad students uh, uh, making interesting discoveries. Uh, well, the, what I took on, I was at the University of Massachusetts at Amherst. And uh, what I took on for my thesis project with, with Professor Joe Taylor was a very high sensitivity search to discover new previously undetected pulsars. And at this point, as I said, pulsars had been known for about 10 years. There were maybe 100 of them or so known. And in fact, interestingly enough, some people thought that this was not a particularly interesting PhD thesis because, uh, you know, what, what more exciting was there to be seen about pulsars? We knew about 100 of them already, et cetera, et cetera. But there were some very good reasons for doing it, and uh, some of them were the fact that the hundred or so pulsars that were known at that point, most of them had been discovered. They had been discovered by a wide variety of different observatories using different observing techniques. So there were lots of selection effects. They weren't all discovered by one method. So you couldn't do good uniform statistics on the ones that were found. Also, it was always interesting to find more pulsars that were very fast pulsars that pulsed very quickly because those were presumably very young pulsars. And also pulsars that were further away in the galaxy because pulsars can be used to probe some parts of the galactic structure. So there were some good reasons to go out and try to find more pulsars with a uniform technique to discover them and also pulsars that had shorter periods, faster pulsing ones, and ones that were further away. So that's what we set out to do, and uh, use the uh, big thousand-foot diameter radio telescope in Arecibo, Puerto Rico, with a computer, which uh, we got from the National Science Foundation for this purpose. And it, one of the interesting things in retrospect, I realize, is that it was an example of how what sort of impact computers have had on doing scientific research, because mm -hmm. the search that I did, I designed and did down at Arecibo was actually over an order of magnitude more sensitive than any search that had been done before, including searches done using that same telescope and radio receiver. It was the fact that the computer could process so much more data made it 10 times more sensitive. Mm -hmm. So uh, the search ended up finding 40 new pulsars, which is really very nice, uh, but one of them turned out to be the first example of a pulsar in a binary system. And so, uh, as I said, it was, it was a classic story of scientific serendipity. We didn't, we didn't set out to find a binary pulsar. Uh, my thesis advisor, Joe Taylor, in the NSF proposal had, in fact, noted that finding one would be really nice. But I think that was really one of those things you put in there, which kind of like wishful thinking. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but uh, I was fortunate enough to find it. And there's an interesting story in terms of the detective, because it wasn't obvious at first that was what, had, what I had found. In fact, it looked very much like my equipment was malfunctioning. <laughs> Uh, because this pulsar wasn't behaving itself properly. Its pulse period kept changing in a way which it wasn't supposed to be changing. So there's an interesting story, and uh, 
probably this isn't necessarily the time to get mm -hmm. into it, but uh, if anybody's interested, you can look on the Nobel Foundation website, and there's my uh, Nobel lecture when I accepted the Nobel Prize, and it gives a narrative story of the sort of scientific adventure, or sometimes they call it the scientific detective story that I had, was privileged to have uh, when I was a grad student in discovering this pulsar. Ooh, we'll check it out. Yeah. <laughs> oh, I just had a question. Like, when because you're like able to achieve all this with your graduate students. Well, when you were a child, like, what were you more into, like a high school student like us? What were your interests? Oh, uh, I, I was definitely going to be a scientist or an engineer. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I uh, the the only question was what what science and what engineering uh, I was going to go into. Uh, from literally the youngest age I can remember, uh, I remember just being really curious about the world around me and how it worked and, uh, and building things and, uh, and taking things apart. <laughs> and uh, so it was always clear to me, certainly. In, in fact, it was interesting. I think the way I would put it, and this is pretty clear memory of, from when I was, uh, when I was uh, younger, was it, was it wasn't that I decided that science or possibly engineering was going to be my career. It was that from the earliest age I can remember, I, real, I knew I was a scientist. Okay. Right, that was just what I was. And to me, that still to this day is something that's very integral to who, who I think I am and what I think I am, is that I'm a scientist. And it's sort of, it's sort of a way of life. And, way, it, and, and I don't mean it with capital pompous <laughs> letters, but it's just sort of that curiosity and all those things that science brings to you that, that I hope other people, like yourselves, <laughs> hopefully have discovered, of, of, the, of the, the satisfying that curiosity about how the natural world works the sort of patience and discipline required to make sure that you really understand something, the self-questioning, the doubt sometimes as to whether you really understand, and then finally triumphing and realizing, yes, you do manage to yeah. understand, and convincing yourself, Retro introspection and honesty with yourself that maybe you didn't really quite understand, you need to look at something again. All those sorts of things, I think, are very much part of my personality. <laughs> That's true. Like, I mean, and so, because you're so into science, have you ever, like, looked at the nanotechnology field or have you, do you, do you have any interest in it? Oh yeah, of course nano, nanotechnology as a field developed uh, well after my graduate days. Uh, <laughs> it's something, something new and fresh for young people like yourself. Uh, it, it, I certainly, I have very eclectic interests in science and engineering, I always have. And so I find a lot of these things very uh, fascinating. The problem is, is that there's only a certain amount of of, of, uh, that one can assimilate and even less, or understand at least something about, and there's even less that one can actually professionally do, <laughs> which is an, <clears throat> excuse me, an enormous frustration for me. But, but nanotechnology is certainly uh, one of those new frontiers in science. You know, it's a cliche, and, and people talk, say that a lot about nanotechnology, but it's, it's, it's true. true. It's, it's true. It, it yeah. really is true. It's allowing us to. Uh, work with the, the world around us and understand and manipulate the world around us at a literal scale, literally a scale that we never were able to manipulate before. That and it true. opens enormous possibilities. Yeah, just like as nano explorers, we're able to have, like each nano explorer is working in different laboratories and each one is focusing on different fields in science and nanotechnology is able to cover them all, like, you know, whether it be biology or chemistry or physics. It, it, yeah. Right. Definitely fine. Right. The public that. conception of nanotechnology tends to focus on a couple of exotic concepts like little nanobots and <laughs> things like that, which is kind of fun to think about. But as you well put it, nanotechnology covers a wide, wide range range of things with applications, everything from medicine through materials, and uh, that is true.